So we're kicking off our 2022 uh, budget process uh, information session for the community. Our format tonight is to have our short presentation. Um, we invite you to hold your questions to the end. Uh, We'll invite you to unmute yourself. If you want to ask a question, our, uh, the best way that uh, we can do it is if you let us know through the chat, you can enter the question in the chat or you can just let us know if you would like to address the group and then we'll invite you to um, unmute yourself uh, when it's your turn. Using the chat function uh, puts everyone's question in order and allows us to make sure that we don't miss um, any of the important questions and comments that people have to share. Next slide, please, Jim. And I think with that, um, I'm turning it over to you. Okay, well, thanks so much, uh, Joanne. So just by way of uh, some of the topics that we're gonna touch on tonight, we're gonna talk a little bit about what's new for 2022, provide some budget highlights, uh, talk about the um, utility rates, the tax rates, and then most importantly, uh, open it up for uh, any questions that, uh, that you have about the, uh, the budget uh, that is being uh, proposed. So just by way of uh, highlights, um, you look at our overall um, spending, and sorry, I'm just gonna adjust something on my screen here since this is kind of blocking part of my uh, view here. Um, overall, our revenues that are um, um, proposed in the, uh, in the draft 2022 budget uh, include $127 million for revenues and uh, just over $107 million for expenses. Uh, keep in mind, uh, those figures are net of the $23 million that we collect on behalf, behalf of other taxing authorities. And uh, for the revenues, you can see the, uh, the breakdown that uh, electrical utilities, uh, that makes up about 43 million followed by taxation. And then when you look at the expenses, uh, our general operations makes up a little over $59 million and the electrical utility uh, just under $38 million. And then you can see the, the distribution of the, uh, the other uh, areas accordingly. Uh, so when we look at um, turning specifically to our general fund and the draft uh, budget, uh, general revenues are $62.9 million with uh, taxation making up uh, uh, about $40 million of that. And you can see followed by sale of services and then the other revenue sources. Turning to our general expenses, uh, general expenses are up uh, to $59.3 million. And uh, something to note is uh, certainly the largest component is our protective services, which includes our RCMP, fire and bylaw. And that comprises about 48%, pardon me, 40% of the, uh, the overall general ex uh, expenses uh, budget. So as I uh, provided uh, to, uh, to council during our um, primer uh, the other week, um, we are faced with incredibly high inflation uh, this year. Uh, in addition, we are also dealing with some sustained losses, both with regards to some of the revenues that have not yet uh, recovered, as well as uh, the community safety issues that we face in the community. And certainly uh, we heard this uh, uh, being brought forward through the notice of motions and uh, council uh, did uh, certainly provide support for a number of, uh, of areas where uh, additional investment could be made into community safety priorities. So looking at those three things, that's really driving uh, much of you know, the situation that we are now in. And so turning to you know, what does it look like from an overall um, numbers perspective, uh, our inflation for labor and other, uh, other uh, cost increases is about $800,000. The RCMP contract increase is also quite sizable at $700,000. And <clears throat> uh, for those of you that are not as familiar with the RCMP, they were without a uh, labor contract for nearly five years. They recently settled that, uh, it dates back to uh, 2017, and that's about a 23.8% increase and so that is quite sizable we were making provisions for it unfortunately the uh, the information we had versus what the actual amount came out was a little bit lower so we were just having to uh, to account for that additional amount and that's really why the rcmp contract is as high as it is and then also i mentioned already the sustained loss so this is really with regards to the the ongoing uh, revenues that we have not uh, uh, yet recovered from relating to our recreational uh, fees uh, as well as the uh, South Okanagan Event Centre 
Center, the Trade and Convention Center, we still are, uh, are anticipating uh, uh, losses there. So there's additional costs there. And then lastly, uh, some of the transit revenue has not yet uh, recovered. Uh, looking at some of the other uh, aspects, uh, there have been some council priority commitments previously made. Uh, these are primarily with regards to public safety. So this is where um, the uh, where council had approved an additional two officers early uh, earlier this year. Uh, in addition, the 2021 budget included two new police uh, officers. However, uh, knowing the delays with regards to those uh, positions coming on uh, on stream, we uh, we didn't uh, fully budget for those, so we need to annualize uh, those. So that's what's comprised of the 700,000. And then um, earlier in fall, Council voted on a number of notice of motions. Uh, primarily, uh, most of these are really focused on community safety, so additional RCMP, uh, increasing bylaw hours, and so that translates to additional bylaw officers, also two additional community safety officers, and some, uh, some other, uh, other priorities there, so that's comprised of the 1.6 million, and then some other critical priorities that have been identified. So, uh, this this pertains to uh, an additional position in our uh, IT department, just dealing with uh, some of the uh, the increased demands, as well as uh, ensuring that we're protecting ourselves against uh, cybersecurity attacks uh, and uh, and what have you, and some uh, some other initiatives there, which we'll get into more detail as we uh, walk through the uh, the department details. Uh, on November 22nd and 23rd. So in total, uh, what we're faced with based upon high inflation, the sustained losses, and uh, these community safety priorities, uh, about a $5.7 million uh, shortfall. So very, uh, very significant and, uh, and quite, uh, quite unprecedented compared to where we have been in previous years. Uh, so in terms of some key strategies that we're looking at in terms of how to, to deal with this, certainly we are very mindful of taking a, a steady approach with regards to taxation. So uh, we, we're trying to minimize any, uh, any uh, tax rate uh, increase shocks to, uh, to our taxpayers. Um, also uh, looking to use the COVID-19 uh, restart grant, which I'll speak to in more detail uh, in a few moments. And then also um, you know, considering in terms of how, how we might be able to phase in uh, some of these impacts uh, into, uh, into future years, and that really translates into how we might be able to uh, make use of, uh, of some other reserves. Uh, and then also just being mindful of you know, how, how we uh, make a gradual return to our pre-COVID condition. And, and this is really looking at how we can contain the uh, uh, costs that the city is dealing with, and then also uh, looking at, at revenue enhancements. Uh, so whether that be some of the return of revenue, such as our recreation fees, um, whether it be the uh, some of the uh, the return of uh, of greater uh, revenue, greater uh, events at the South Okanagan Event Center, or that could even consider other uh, other revenue sources or the expansion of other revenue sources that the uh, city currently has. And um, as we have been doing in the past, and will certainly continue to, is seeking other uh, funding opportunities wherever possible to help uh, defray. Uh, uh, the the costs of uh, of delivering services uh, to uh, to the community, and fairly recently we have been successful with uh, with securing uh, some grants in our social development area to uh, to help with uh, with some of the programs that we are delivering there. So in terms of turning to city reserves, I know there's been lots of discussion uh, over the past several months about well you know the city uh, the city is is very healthy with uh, with its reserves, so why don't we just turn to uh, to those and make use of those. And certainly that's something that we, uh, we, we uh, can consider and, and should consider, uh, but just to be mindful, you know, of the $106 million in reserves that the, uh, the city had as at the end of uh, 2020, about $28 million of those are statutory reserves. So there's some fairly strict uh, restrictions on those. There's another $19 million in, uh, that's set aside uh, that's being collected uh, for uh, development cost charges. Uh, there's also just under $37 million in uh, utility reserves. And those reserves are really um, set aside to deal with some of the, uh, not only on the operations of those uh, facilities, but more importantly, uh, there's a number of sizable up, uh, upcoming capital projects that are needed, both in our water, our sewer, and our electrical utilities, and so that's uh, that's uh, why those those reserves are sitting at the, at the balance of where they are. Uh, we also have some other restricted ones, such as the COVID Restart Grant, Recycle BC, and they total about the, um, about four and a half million. So 
you know, when we when we back out all of those others, there's about $18 million in reserves for consideration. So these are things that we could uh, we could turn to and look at in terms of making use of those. So, you know, breaking it down a little bit further of those, um, certainly the, the top four, our stabilization reserve, our gaming reserve, uh, and our surplus reserve are really the ones that would uh, would be uh, most uh, most appropriate to, uh, to consider. And so that gives us a balance of about $12 million in reserves that, that we could, uh, could consider uh, um, going uh, going forward with so certainly council has the prerogative to to look at others but but certainly I think those four would be the ones that we want to look at them first and foremost. Uh, turning to to capital, um, the uh, the draft budget includes about forty six point eight million dollars in proposed capital spending and you can see how it breaks down between our water and uh, sewer utilities that are looking to spend the most, followed then by the electrical utility and engineering. Um, this is considerably higher than what we normally spend. So in any year, we're spending anywhere between 16 and $20 million. And uh, so we're really looking to, uh, to invest quite significantly in our infrastructure uh, this year, just with some of the uh, sizable projects and some of the needs that do exist. And our ability to really move beyond um, what we, uh, what we uh, traditionally uh, fund is going beyond some of the traditional funding sources. And what, what is proposed in the, uh, the plan is to really use debt to increase our infrastructure investment starting in 2022. And you can see on the graph there that, uh, you know, as part of that $46 million, there's about $16 million that's proposed uh, to be funded uh, by, by borrowing. And, uh, and certainly when we look at borrowing right now, interest rates are extremely low. In addition, our debt levels are very, very attractive um, at, the, at the city that we have been significantly paying down our debt in the, uh, over the past several, uh, several years. Uh, so turning to utility rates, because I know that, that certainly is another, <clears throat> another um, question that does arise. And uh, earlier in fall, staff did bring forward proposed uh, utility rate increases to the council uh, and council chose not to uh, to um, uh, approve and adopt the bylaw at that point and instead what they wanted to do is they wanted to have the discussion on utility rates during the uh, the budget deliberations so this is something that will uh, will come up and be discussed uh, during budget deliberations but for the purpose of the uh, draft financial plan that has has been uh, put forward. Uh, it does include a proposed 2% uh, increase for electrical, 2% for sanitary sewer, 0.6 for water, and 25% uh, for the uh, stormwater. So just turning to electrical, because I know there's been some comments in terms of, well, are the rates too high? Have we been overcharging, uh, et cetera? Um, we have not had a rate increase in the past five years. So uh, between 2017 and 2020, uh, there was a 0% uh, rate increase for electrical. And in 2021, council approved a 3% uh, rate uh, reduction. Uh, in addition, they uh, also approved and uh, we have implemented a uh, the 10% the prompt payment discount that uh, was was provided to those that paid on time has now also been extended to all uh, all rate payers. So regardless of whether you pay on time or not, um, you do receive the uh, the 10% uh, payment uh, discount. So turning to taxation, and uh, uh, certainly as as everyone has heard, what we are proposing, at least as a starting point, tax increase is eight and a half percent, and. Uh, 4.1% of that is really driven by <clears throat> the extremely high inflationary costs that we're faced with this year. And 4.4% uh, uh, relates to the community safety initiatives that, uh, that are included in the budget. And then some of the other assumptions to, uh, to consider is that uh, we are proposing to, to use the balance of the COVID-19 restart grant, and that equates to about 7%. So if we were not using that, we would see a further uh, tax increase of, uh, of about 7%. Um, now, certainly, uh, as I indicate, this is a starting point and uh, uh, council will uh, will certainly be discussing uh, every department budget, but also more broadly, uh, what does this look like? Uh, what is the level of, of taxation increase that uh, that is uh, uh, acceptable to them? And uh, and certainly, you know, there is an ability to uh, 
to reduce uh, some of these rate increases, but one has to be mindful that any uh, any of these uh, th these um, increases that are not put into place, they will have impacts into the future year. So, you know, essentially there is going to have to be a recovery of these uh, th these revenues in uh, in future years, and uh, you know some of that may be offset as we're seeing some recoveries with regards to our other uh, revenues. Um, but uh, you know, regardless, there there will be some sort of uh, it, it likely have some sort of deferral of the, uh, the the rate impacts into future years, and this is what council will uh, will need to discuss and and determine um, you know how they may wish to uh, to uh, phase phase those uh, those costs uh, in to uh, to uh, future future year uh, uh, budgets. So in terms of tax competitiveness, so how does Pentec compare to others? Um, Penticton has a very attractive uh, tax uh, uh, you know, tax rate or, or, or I guess level of, of funding. So when we look at, uh, we compare ourselves uh, across uh, the Okanagan Valley to four other uh, municipalities, either in close proximity or similar size. And based upon a typical household, uh, Penticton does, uh, does pay the lowest compared to Vernon, Kelowna, Summerland, and West uh, Kelowna. Um, but we also do recognize that um, uh, our medium income is, is probably lower than others. And at least this is based upon the, uh, uh, the, the census uh, from 2016. So when we look at both our taxes and, uh, and charges, the comparison, you can see we, uh, we, we are very, very competitive uh, in comparison to, uh, to other municipalities. And so what does it mean, uh, this draft budget for a, a typical uh, residential uh, property? Uh, well, it would equate to a $134 increase on an annual basis. And then you can also see the, uh, the other utilities, how those, um, uh, those amounts uh, um, pertain for each of those. So in total, a average residential property would pay an additional $185 per year or an extra $15 per month. Um, in terms of uh, business tax, and certainly something that we have uh, discussed um, a number for a number of years is the business tax multiplier. And, uh, and certainly, you know, Penticton is, uh, maintains a very competitive uh, um, tax climate in comparison to other uh, municipalities in, uh, in the Valley. And, uh, and so in 2021, our multiplier was set at 1.91. And what is included in the draft budget is uh, following through on council's direction to move the multiplier up to 2.0 for 2022. So you can see that's the uh, the the orange, uh, or pardon me, the, uh, the you know the red moving to the uh, green bar on the bar bottom. Um, even with that uh, that very uh, small increase, uh, we still uh, remain very very competitive compared to Summerland, Kelowna, West Kelowna, and uh, and Vernon. So what does it mean for a, a, a typical business? Well, uh, this would translate to a uh, overall uh, increase, including taxes and utilities of $1,359 annually or about $113 per, uh, per month. So just gonna, before I wrap up, you know, a couple of questions that, that may be on people's minds, because I've, I've heard these questions raised in, uh, in other forums. And uh, a lot of talk about the the restart grant, and uh, you know what uh, you know what, what is it what was it really intended for? Uh, what's left in it, and and that type of thing. So, when the province announced and uh, and made this uh, this grant available, uh, the intention behind this was really to preserve municipalities' financial health. So there was a lot of uncertainty back in 2020, just with regards to the ability uh, to to collect taxes. Uh, have utility uh, bills paid, etc. And so uh, the province was very mindful of, uh, of that. And uh, certainly there was uh, correspondence that was provided that uh, really laid out what, uh, what it could, uh, could be used for. So the eligibility uh, aspects and those that are not eligible. And so it was really intended for a liquidity inje uh, injection for uh, governments, for local government, recognizing that 
many businesses, many not-for-profits had access to a host of other provincial and federal um, programs, such as the, uh, the, the wage subsidy, the rental subsidy, et cetera. And so they were able to access those programs. Local governments had no access to any of those. And that was really the purpose of the grant. And so, as you can see, some of the eligible costs that could uh, could be applied to this was really uh, municipalities dealing with revenue shortfalls, facility reopening and response costs pertaining to COVID, emergency planning, you know, bylaw enforcement protection services, replenishing reserves, uh, et cetera. Um, and then some, some restrictions. Certainly there's some limitations with regards to assisting businesses, not intended for capital costs generally, and uh, also that it was not intended to keep taxes artificially low. So when you look at, um, so how have we used the $4.7 million that the city received? Uh, so in 2020, uh, we uh, used a million dollars of this grant to replenish our financial stabilization reserve, which we had uh, essentially depleted to provide the 2.9% uh, tax relief to every taxpayer in the city. Uh, in 2021, as part of balancing our budget and dealing with the, uh, the, the uh, shortfall in revenues, uh, we did draw $1.3 million uh, from, uh, from the, um, the restart grant. Uh, there's also several hundred thousand dollars that was earmarked uh, for some, uh, some restart initiatives that were brought forward by the, uh, the COVID-19 task force. And so that's how we end up with a balance of $2.4 million that we are proposing to use in, uh, in the, uh, the upcoming uh, budget. Uh, so, you know, one of the other questions is, you know, can the city use reserves instead of increasing uh, taxation? And I would say absolutely, there is that ability. And, you know, first and foremost, we are proposing to use the remaining $2.4 million of the COVID restart grant to certainly help with, uh, with this year. Um, and I I'd say, you know, the only thing that one has to be mindful of is uh, if, if we use reserves, those are not a sustainable uh, funding source. And so if, uh, if, if you're doing uh, drawing from a reserve, um, you really have to be looking at, um, you know, how are you going to make up that revenue stream in future years? And, uh, and so, uh, you know, really have to be creating a sustainable funding plan. So if you're going to draw several million dollars from a reserve, uh, once that reserve is depleted, what's your plan uh, with regards to, uh, to um, replenishing that, uh, that revenue source? So, uh, so absolutely can be done. And certainly I think this is going to be much of the discussion that council will uh, will have on November the 22nd and 23rd in terms of how much uh, do they feel that uh, that uh, the, you know the costs should be uh, pro um, sort of provided uh, or passed on to taxpayers in the uh, in the upcoming year versus spread over uh, subsequent years. Um, so one of the other questions too is, you know, why are utility rates going up? Um, well, as I indicated, uh, electric, we've seen no increase in rates since 2016. Um, early indications, uh, this is not yet confirmed uh, because Fortis has put their application forward to the BCUC and we will not know until after the budget is finalized, but they are projecting um, <clears throat> their, their costs for basically the cost for us to purchase power in the uh, range of three to, to 4%. Uh, and, and in order for us to, uh, to um, essentially balance, uh, you know, balance that utility, uh, we are proposing a, a 2% uh, increase. Uh, in terms of water and sewer, uh, those increases, uh, I think we've worked hard to try to keep those to a very manageable level. Uh, but but we are needing to uh, to incorporate some increases, and this is really to deal with some of the significant upcoming capital uh, projects that we have over the next uh, several years, and then also dealing with the uh, the very significant inflation uh, increases. Uh, just with regards to those utilities, we're seeing dramatic increases, uh, whether it be uh, some of the uh, some of the the cost of, of pipes. Uh, chemicals and uh, and other uh, uh, other supplies and equipment that are needed in those uh, those areas of the city, uh, and then one of the other questions uh, I think you know this is is fairly uh, fairly uh, well known already, but uh, you know does the uh, does the um, Lake Lake bike route uh, have have funding included? And uh, and yes, there is 4.7 million dollars uh, included. And uh, what is currently proposed is that this would be uh, internally uh, funded. So essentially what's proposed is, it, uh, is that funding would be borrowed from the electrical utility 
uh, and then repaid back over a uh, over a period of time to uh, to complete the. Um, this would be section, I believe it's section two of uh, of the bike route. So with that, that uh, completes my uh, my presentation, and I'll maybe just stop sharing uh, my screen, and then we'll open it up for any questions that uh, anyone has. Yeah, thanks so much, Jim. Uh, that was a really great summary. And really, our goal with these sessions is we want to take your feedback back to Council. We want to hear what questions you have, what concerns you have, and we'll summarize that <coughs> feedback and report it back to Council. Uh, so, you know, please think about um, did this budget hit the mark in terms of priorities? Did it meet your expectations in terms of community safety? What's missing? Um, what other concerns might you have? So uh, we're going to take a look at, uh, we've got one, one new question in our chat that will respond, but after that, I, I will be calling on you to share your thoughts on what you heard, what you expected, what you're hearing on the street. Uh, the, this announcement came out over a week ago now, and uh, so what have you been hearing from your colleagues in your network? So, so please uh, give that some thought, and we will um, we'll turn the floor over to you after we just uh, answer uh, Steve Brown's question in the chat. Um, so I don't know if you're seeing that there, Jim, and I don't know if you want to unmute yourself, but I'll, I'll happily read your question for you, Steve. Um, so Steve, oh, there you go. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, hi, uh, everyone. Um, uh, as you know, uh, I, I've had discussions both with Jim and Frank and, and other members of council uh, uh, in regard to the business tax multiplier, which quite frankly is a meaningless number uh, in that it's only a factor used in determining what the ultimate mill rate is. So my question is, is what are the mill rates for the other municipalities to which we're comparing ourselves? We need to know if we're competitive because you can have a much higher mill rate or pardon me, a much higher business tax multiplier, but still have a lower mill rate. So I'd like to know, I mean, the real comparison is what are the mill rates? And I noticed that we seem to avoid publishing that uh, year after year. So I'd really like to know what those mill rates are for the, for the other, uh, uh, municipalities that we're comparing ourselves to. Thanks. Thanks for raising that, Steve. Um, I don't have those rates with me. That's something that we can, uh, you know, we we can uh, dig into, and we can certainly get uh, get those uh, those back. I think one of the things to keep in mind, and this is why when we do our tax comparisons, what we're doing is we're we're, we're really uh, normally we're we're looking at um, taxes and other charges for a a typical uh, property, whether it be a residential property or for a, a business property, and saying, well, so how much does does a typical property uh, pay? Because we're we're you know um, looking at you know a I'll just use a residential property. A typical property in Penticton might be 500,000. A typical property in, let's say, West Kelowna or Kelowna would be perhaps about 700,000. And so, looking at at using that as the base, um, that's that's the approach that we uh, have have gone with, as opposed to just sort of looking at you know the mill rate, which translates to how much uh, you're paying per hundred thousand dollars of uh, of uh, of assessment. Just, uh, but but happy to to dig into that information and get uh, get that uh, that back to uh, to you just so you've got uh, got that uh, at your fingertips thank you great thanks um not to call on you daryl but you did unmute yourself did you um want to address the group or shall i move on to Lori's uh question next question in the chat oh of course i want to address the group you know <laughs> me i'm not going to sit here and be quiet for very long um I was part of the electrical rate review a while ago, and I watched what they said we should be doing, and we're following what they should be doing. And it seems we've forgotten what was said back then. And I, I'm sorry, as far as business goes, the increase in the business tax, the business tax multiplier, the electrical rates and all that, I'm actually quite disappointed in this budget. I'm not happy with it at all. Um, I think it's going to affect not only business but homeowners and things like that um, when you start looking back through all the paperwork and you start looking at the city saying oh well we're we, we're going to hire nine new employees but we're funding you know, we want 12 and there's there's numbers that don't make sense here so there's going to be a lot of hard looks at it and to be quite honest business and 
people on the street are, are absolutely gobsmacked by an eight and a half percent increase. It's not fathomable when you're talking about putting 4.7 million into more bike lanes, when you're talking about the storm sewers and everything like that. There are so many costs here that need to be looked at again. And 8.5 is not going to do it. And realistically, what's it going to be for business? You're changing the, the business, the, the tax rate. What is it really? I mean, come on, let's let's get down to the real numbers. Frank, you know what goes on with, with the budgets and stuff like that. This is not really acceptable for the people of Penticton. I'm sorry, but it's just not. Thanks for that, Daryl. There were a few questions in there. Did you um, have some uh, responses ready there, Jim? I can also remind you on the, on the questions that I heard. Um, yeah, actually, why don't you just sort of re, uh, remind me on uh, on those, and I'll I'll try to answer what I can for Daryl. And uh... yes, the one that that stood out was the reference to the addition of staff, um, mm -hmm. and that being um, you know part of this budget. So. Yeah, so I'll start with that, uh, Daryl. And yeah, the, the budget does include a proposed increase of 12 staff. And um, that is very sizable. It's probably uh, one of the largest uh, staff increases uh, in my time with the, with the city. Uh, but do keep in mind, 11 of those staff pertain to the community safety priorities that have been identified uh, um, through, uh, through our process, uh, through the notice of motion. So that includes uh, two uh, additional civilian RCMP members. It includes five additional bylaw officers, a, uh, and along with that, a, um, an intake administrator, two additional community safety um, officers, and, uh, and then a, an, an additional firefighter. And, uh, and then uh, we, we do have uh, one additional position that we are proposing in our IT department, just dealing with the, the increased demands on, uh, on all of our systems and the increased risks that we're facing with regards to uh, uh, cybersecurity threats and, uh, and that, that type of thing. So, but, but I do agree, it is a, it is a very sizable staff uh, increase. And uh, um, you know, I guess part of the discussion will be um, you know, this, this is a, uh, an enhancement of services. I think uh, many people in the community feel that there is a need for that. And uh, I guess the discussion will have to, uh, have to, uh, you know, determine in terms of if, if there is support for that, that uh, all of those increases, and then, uh, you know, how, how it would be uh, ultimately paid for. On, in your own documentation that, that I looked at, it says 12 on one page and nine on the other. So how are you giving me 11? Um, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure about the, the nine that you are. Um, yeah, what are you referencing, Daryl? Yeah. Um, the, the budget documents that came out earlier. Was that in the business plan or the financial plan? Yeah, document? something like that. I'm not quite sure where I, I got them from. It came through the, through the chamber. Yeah. But that's what okay. That's yeah. So yeah, I, I can't comment on the, the figure of nine, but on, on page eight of our corporate business plan, we do have a, uh, a table there that shows uh, the 12 uh, the increased FTEs. And I'm just kind of looking on our financial plan. Um, yeah, on page 11 of our financial plan is where we, uh, we, we do also have a very similar table that shows that we're going from, uh, from um, 306 FTEs, uh, an increase of 12 to 318. So uh, yeah, so I, I, I couldn't comment on the, uh, on the nine figure that you're commenting on, but the page eight and page 12 of those two documents do reference an increase of 12. The other so, question I would have for you guys is the storm sewer costs. Where, I, I keep hearing about these massive projects that we're gonna have coming in and those should have been on the books for years. Uh -huh. um, why is it all of a sudden now that we have to do them in 2022? Um, well, there's there's a, a number of projects that we're doing this year and sort of going into uh, into future years. So if we look at our capital over the next number of years, uh, those those projects are are being phased in. But there are several projects, and you know I think as we delve into uh, into the budget uh, on the 22nd and the 23rd, that'll I think provide a little bit more. Uh, detail, but there's a few sizable water and uh, and sewer projects that uh, just with regards to the state and condition of um, of our uh, uh, infrastructure that uh, 
I think our, you know, our, our engineering department determined that now is the time to move forward on those. Um, many of those sizable projects we are looking to borrow uh, and that way we can uh, basically spread the cost of those projects out over the, uh, uh, you know, the next, uh, you know, 20, 25 years. And the one other question I, I do have is we're, we're taking $4.7 million under the electrical utility to go over to the bike lanes. Isn't that robbing Peter to pay Paul? Um, what, what we're doing is, and this is why we have presented it as borrowing. So we would borrow from that reserve because that reserve is sitting in, uh, you know, in a healthy position. So, so we would borrow from that and then we would repay it over, uh, over a period of time. So um, it's not as though we're, we're taking it out of there and never returning uh, that, uh, that funding. And that is something that municipalities are able to do. So um, there are a number of reserves that we are able to uh, internally uh, borrow from, but there is a requirement that there be a repayment plan to, uh, to pay that back over, uh, um, you know, over a, a set period of time. Okay, that's all I got. Thanks, Daryl. And uh, so, so Lori's question actually connects a bit to uh, some of Daryl's comments. Um, so Lori asks, Lori, I don't know if, if, I'll just go ahead and ask it, and Lori, if you want to unmute and you can comment on it too. But she's asking, uh, you know, the COVID reserve isn't revenue and could be, should be used uh, to reduce the increases in the security costs. So. I think there's an opportunity to answer that question, but I also think there's an opportunity um, to speak to uh, the implications of using um, uh, the grant funds to kind of offset the cost for this year and what the implications are over the longer term. Yeah, and, and, and certainly, you know, there is an ability to use the COVID uh, funds to, uh, to offset some of those increased uh, public safety uh, costs, uh, but there are also some, you know, some other issues that we're contending with. And so, you know, one of the significant issues is the, um, some of the sustained losses that we are, uh, are dealing with. So in other words, you know, our revenues for uh, the community center, you know, recreation fees, those are still tracking about $700,000 lower uh, than where we were prior to, uh, to, the, uh, to the pandemic. Uh, we also um, have not seen a return of events to uh, the South Okanagan Events Center and some of the other, uh, other activities at the uh, Trade and Convention Center. So there's certainly some losses there. So, you know, it's a little bit of, um, we could use the, the COVID dollars to, to cover uh, the increased security costs. However, um, there's we, we need to find another source to deal with some of these other losses. So it's it's sort of a case of where where do you uh, um, uh, you, you know I, I guess in terms of we, we'd have to find find another uh, another source of uh, funding for uh, for that uh, that situation then. So hopefully that that answers uh, uh, your uh, your question there, uh, Lori. And, uh, and then the, what was the next question there, Joanne? Uh, well, the next one in the chat or is, um, is that what you're referring to, Jim? Well, just in terms, of, I wasn't sure if Lori had a second question that uh, just sort of. I have another one, but it's about the uh, bike. Thank you very much, but it's about the, uh, the bike route. Okay, um, yeah. Which is, is very contentious. I, I'm not sure why, but it seems like it's very contentious. Mm -hmm. um, are there um, grant monies available federally or provincially <clears throat> to help with that transit route? Because it's very uh, popular right now <laughs> to have a <clears throat> low emission route. And so it's really necessary that we have this in place in the city. So <laughs> it's gonna cost money and people are freaking out. Is the, are there gonna be grants? Uh, yeah, in terms of there certainly are a number of programs that are available um, for, uh, for for these types of projects. Um, you know, earlier this year we were successful with securing a million dollars to to deal with the initial portion of the the bike lane. And uh, my understanding is there are other programs that that currently exist. And so uh, um, we certainly would be looking at uh, you know exploring and, and trying to uh, to secure any of those uh, those additional. Uh, grant uh, uh, grant um, funds uh, 
if uh, if there is a you know decision from council that they are wanting to move forward on the on this next phase of the project. So if that money is borrowed from the funds that are already um, available, um, mm -hmm. and would the grants then just repay that to reduce that uh, loan? Yeah, I, I think that, you know, sort of depending upon how this all came about, but I think the, you know, the intent is um, if, if we're able to secure some grant funding, then we would not need to, uh, to borrow quite as much uh, from the electrical uh, utility and, uh, and uh, um, sort of manage the project in that, in that manner. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so I, I have a question from Hector and Hector, please feel free to clarify if, if I didn't get your question quite right. Um, but I'm just, I think what you're asking is uh, what is, uh, does the budget provide for in terms of transit service if we're providing uh, uh, for bike infrastructure? Um, yeah, I, in terms of, I can't comment on the specifics with regards to, uh, you know, I, I'd say that uh, it, it's maintaining, I think, a fairly consistent level of service from where we were this past uh, past year. Um, but I would say, you know, on, on that that point, that's that's something we can either get some uh, some further details back, or certainly when we uh, when we go through the detailed budgets on November the twenty second, we'll have much more uh, more detail on on that. Um, unless I, I know, Donnie, I just saw you're you are unmuting. Yeah. Uh, you may have some further insights. Uh, Jim, just to say that uh, you're precisely right. It's a, it's a fairly consistent approach uh, for this upcoming year with some minor enhancements uh, in the neighborhood of Sendero Canyon and, and the ridge. Uh, and when I say minor enhancements, I really mean minor. And then there's a process to review the entire transit infrastructure that'll be taking place um, in coordination with BC Transit over the next year. Um, but that should be noted that uh, that's keeping consistent. Uh, well, we've seen a, a uh, decline a small decline in ridership and uh, transit fares so um, still still a pretty significant investment in transit for this year mm -hmm. okay our next question and or comment comes from steve and then we'll get to you diane so if you want to get ready to um to unmute yourself um and steve did you want to make your comments i see you're unmuted as well sure. um yeah the the bike lane um there's a lot of issues around this thing and spending $4.7 million at this point to expand this thing further when we don't even have appropriate utilization of this bike lane at the current time. And I see that we don't have any actual utilization statistics on, on this thing. I think that the time is that we now need to spend a year gathering the statistics over a full year so that we get a sense of what the real utilization of this thing is and determine whether or not this thing is actually needed beyond what you've got. And to be honest, I think that it's out of line for this council to be making that decision for a council that's going to have to live with the consequences uh, come next October. And I think we have an opportunity here to get some real statistics on this before we just go blowing seven point or four point seven million dollars uh, on expanding that uh, on that bike lane. Um, I think it's really important because you've got a lot of people out here that are really, really upset about this. And the fact that you're gonna go and take this money out of the electrical reserve in order to pay for this thing, um, I, I think is folly on, on the part of council. And I think that they need to take a real serious look at where they're at with that thing. Um, so that's my comment on the bike lane. Um, the other thing while I'm on here, Joanne, because I did it put in a couple of other questions yeah, I see that. there. Yep. Um, I, I'm interested in, and it's rather interesting to listen to all of the conversations around uh, community safety and the increase in RCMP in, uh, in bylaw and so on. One of the things is, is that uh, I think uh, 
I, along with many, many other people, know that there are no RCMP officers readily available, that this is not going to be a fix tomorrow or next year or even two years from now or three years from now. This is a long way off because there are no RCMP officers available. And I have some real serious questions around, is everybody just jumping on the bandwagon because it's a sexy thing to say right now that, hey, I'm all for public safety and we've got to get this thing cleaned up. The reality is if we're going to spend that kind of money, can anybody tell me what the anticipated decrease in, in criminal activity is going to be? Have we actually looked at that? Have we studied that? Because that's what the community is looking for. You know, if we're just bringing in a bunch more RCMP officers to clean up the paperwork that the current guys are unable to keep up with, that's really not helping us. And I think that the community is looking for changes in our community policing and, or, you know, and by the RCMP in order to reduce crime. And that's not going to happen, or at least I don't think it's going to happen. And I'd love to hear what the statistics are that you guys think you're going to reduce crime by, by bringing in all these extra officers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, and I think good. Those are really, uh, really good, uh, good points, uh, Steve. I uh, think one of the things that is included in the budget and it's proposed is that we undertake a, a public safety review. And so this really looks at how um, how the existing resources are being used, how they're being deployed, and how um, you know how much um, further in terms of uh, resource increases may need to be made uh, to to help address some of these issues. And while um, well, it's a difficult uh, thing to be able to answer this this question in terms of what's you know what's the correlation of more officers to reduced crime. Um, having this the review undertaken, I think, is going to help us to get closer to, uh, to better understanding uh, those uh, th those questions that you you pose. Um, I think, in terms of you know, just maybe more more immediate, if we look at uh, each quarter, our superintendent does come uh, come in front of council, provides his quarterly update with regards to his statistics, and certainly one of the things that we continue to hear from him is just with regards to the uh, the level of of activity. Uh, you know the, uh, the the case file that his officers are dealing with, and uh, and, and that type of thing. Um, the majority of their time is just spent on reactive type of things. They have no capacity to deal with some of the proactive things that can help actually sort of get in front of this. And so I think, um, although it's not, uh, we, we don't have, have this um, statistically available, I think anecdotally what we're hearing from the superintendent is if there's a, a increased capacity of officers to deal with uh, and, and put some of their time on and, and to some of these proactive activities, that will certainly help to, uh, to deal with uh, with the uh, uh, the um, immense amount of uh, of um, criminal activity that, uh, that 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 is happening. I I don't disagree with that, and I and I uh, and I totally sympathize with that. But the mm -hmm. reality is, I don't care how many police officers you've got out there on the mm -hmm. beat. If we're yep. going to go out there and we're going to arrest people, and then we're going to drag them down to the courthouse so that the judges can kick them back out onto the street. It's kind of a waste of time, effort, and money. And I think that we need to have a really, really far deeper look and a far more serious look at this than just sitting in at a budget meeting and say, hey, we're gonna throw, you know, a million dollars or however many dollars at this thing uh, and hope like hell that it fixes itself. Uh, I, I think it's folly. I'm glad to hear that there's going to be a review, and I think that that really needs to be undertaken before we get all carried away throwing a bunch of money at, at a problem that we're not going to solve with just money. Mm -hmm. yeah. hey, Steve, did you want to jump okay. in there, Donnie? You know, I, I think I think both uh, Jim and Steve actually captured uh, some of what I was going to say in terms of, uh, I think, as Jim noted, uh, our case per cases per member is two and a half times the provincial average. So I think there's an interim solution. Steve, you recognize as well that there is uh, there is a sh I don't want to say a shortage of RCMP officers, but they don't show up overnight. Um, once once they're procured, 
Um, and uh, but I think you're correct to identify that long term we need a strategy, and I think council recognize that as well by asking for us to uh, to move forward with a longer term strategy to look at uh, public safety. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, and, thank you. And then did um, I, I've kind of felt like a lot of Steve's comments on the bike route were were largely, you know, um, stating your viewpoints on that. Um, I don't know. If, um, definitely feedback that we can take forward. Sure. Okay. Well, let let me just say. I mean, I'm downtown every day. I work down there. Um, I don't see very many people in the bike lane. And here's the other issue that we have with this uh, is that. I was stuck at an intersection for about 10 minutes one day as we were trying to get a truck with a tractor trailer around the corner because the damn bike lane was in the way. Now, this is not a one off. We know that there's trouble with a lot of those corners. The engineering on this thing has not been really that great. And I've even watched buses because my daughter lives along this route and I've been there and I've watched buses have to drive up onto the sidewalk to make it around corners because this thing is poorly engineered. And it's just, it, the whole thing is just a nightmare. And I think, you know, we really need to take a look at that because we need to consider what are the real commercial uh, routes in and out of that downtown area and through that area that the bike lane is in. And given that you're now looking at that north gateway um, coming in, you know, and you're looking at putting more bike lanes in there, that whole thing around commercial uh, transportation, tran uh, public transit and so on, I think that that needs a lot more consideration and a lot more study before we just go ahead and start banging another $4.7 million into what is already a problem. Yeah, thanks That's for that. That's personal yeah. observation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would just, just offer, Steve, and um, I'm, I, um, um, we're not, you know, I accept your feedback and we're going to take that forward just for the um, the benefit uh, of the group. So the thinking there is that there are definitely some some trade offs when you make this type of, of change and that there is a need to adjust to that change over time. Um, counting uh, bikes at this point when the route is not uh, fully developed uh, may not be a fair representation. And there's also the prevailing theory is that uh, that use does grow over time and that this initiative was is driven by the need to provide active infrastructure and in support of the OCP. But I definitely hear your comments about cost um, at this time. So uh, we'll definitely take that forward. Mm -hmm. I think my, my comments are more about utilization as much okay. as the cost. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Stephen. All right. Uh, Diane has been so patient. Um. <laughs> um, no, actually, I do agree with Stephen. Putting a Band-Aid on the problem and, and the municipality continuously putting dollars into it is not a solution. But that's mm -hmm. not what my question is about. My question is, um, I actually have gone through the documentation, and I'm not going to nitpick any of the dollars and cents, whatever. But, you know, one of the comments on here is, is Penticton continues to have one of the lowest total residential taxes. And, uh, but, and then the comparison to the business tax to the rest of the Okanagan and Vernon, West Kelowna, uh, Kelowna. Well, you know what? It's not a fair comparison to compare businesses in Penticton to Kelowna, Vernon, because they have a major opportunity when it comes to transportation. And that's something Penticton businesses deal with. Uh, it's a major challenge. So the weight, you know, and given the fact that there is continuously people moving into um, Penticton with big dollars, they're, 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 they're retiring or whatever, and yet they get the tax benefit. They get the tax benefit by moving here residentially, they paid their taxes in Vancouver, they paid their taxes in Alberta. Meanwhile, the businesses here that struggle, seriously struggle, they're the ones that are carrying the burden all the time. And I think, you know, I think, you know, when you hear from the businesses, they're not being the, the winders, they're not squeaking, they're just saying they can't take it anymore. And once again, we're going into a session where we all understand there's, there's, there's increases that has to happen. We get it. 
but I think it is about time the residential picked up a little bit more slack. You know, I think it should be shared a little bit more. And I know development's going to happen. But once again, when great projects come up where it could spread the wealth, um, it doesn't happen because the surrounding neighborhood does not want that development to happen. And so the point is not getting clear that unless we have development, unless we spread the taxes, our businesses here are going to sink. And there's going to be no there's going to be no incentive to Brit for, for businesses to come here because the taxes are too high and it's the residential that reap the wealth and uh, they're going to have to go. I don't know where they're going to have to go to shop, but they're not going to be able to find anywhere here to shop. <laughs> Thanks for that, Diane. Yeah. So um, I just, I was going to provide some comments. Uh, appreciate your, your comments, Diane. And I don't have it, I didn't include it in my slide deck. I know normally we were including some of those things when we were looking at uh, at some of our tax rates and what have you, and just sort of showing in terms of what, what the distribution of assessment uh, values are between residential and business. And, and, and what is the shift that, uh, that is being made you know, through the use of the, uh, the multiplier. And, uh, and certainly that's something that I can, uh, can, uh, can pull up and sort of show how, how do some of those things compare to, um, to some of the other municipalities? Because I know the, the multiplier is kind of the, the mechanism by which we, we shift that tax burden, but it, it isn't always, or it may not necessarily be the, the most uh, indicative or at least the most informative way to sort of see, you know, how, how is the tax distribution between residential and uh, businesses in Penticton versus some of the other uh, uh, jurisdictions that we uh, compare ourselves to. So I'll, I'll uh, dig in and, and find some of that information so that uh, we can get, the, get that out so people can see, uh, see uh, things uh, clearly in that regard. Great, thank you. I've written all that down, Diane. Um, I'll turn it over to Jonathan now, who's been very patient. Thank you, Diane. Uh, and Tim, thank you very much uh, for the effort you and your team did in putting this together uh, to help uh, enlighten us. Uh, and also to stand there and, and take the uh, questions that are being uh, thrown at you here. Um, I know it's been very, it's very, what you did was probably one of the most difficult things to do is, is uh, propose an 8.5% increase. That does not make you a very popular person here in Penticton. Uh, the easiest thing would have been to say 0% increase and you'd have been the hero, right? But uh, so I appreciate you, uh, you know, doing the hard work and, and trying to, you know, fund the expenses that the city's facing uh, this year and, and down the road. Um, I haven't said that, you know, I do have some questions. And uh, I, I just want to, and it's kind of for the benefit of all of us, is when we're looking at the, the different departments, we've got electrical, water, sewer, they all ran, they're all budgeted for surpluses. And uh, those surpluses in, in those uh, departments are, are pretty much earmarked for those departments and uh, or functions. Uh, but then we get to the general revenues. And the, the general surplus from what I wrote down, like, correct me if I'm wrong, but it looks like we're, your budget roughly $3.6 million surplus, which is 62.9 million in revenue and 59.3 million in expenses. So if I did my math right, I don't, I, I'm, I'm no longer practicing accounting, so I may have that number wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in that number, is that, have you budgeted for the $5.7 million shortfall that's been accumulated? So you, you mentioned before there's a $5.7 million shortfall, uh, which includes the $1.6 million for, for um, uh, uh, safety and security, policing, uh, and some of the other smaller items you had mentioned earlier. Is that, that, is that yeah. all included in that? Yeah, yeah so, yeah, so the, you know, the $5.7 million that I, that I identified on that one slide it was basically showing here. Here's the gap. This is kind of what we are having to uh, to deal with. And so the the draft budget um, includes, you know, how how we go about bridging uh, bridging that. So by uh, taking 2.4 million dollars from uh, uh, you know from the the COVID restart uh, grant, um, using uh, um, having some increased uh, you know looking at the eight and a half percent tax increase, we do have some uh, some additional revenues for our our growth or our non-market change of about six hundred thousand dollars. So, you know, the the five point seven million dollars was this. This is the challenge that we faced, 
and then how do we go about solving it? And it was really through the use of the COVID grant, tax increases, uh, some of the, the, the other revenue uh, growth that, we, uh, that we're seeing to, uh, to end up with, a, um, uh, with an overall uh, balanced budget for, uh, for 2022. So hopefully that, does that answer, uh, answer your, clarify yeah, things yeah. for so, you there, Jonathan? So, yeah, you did, you answered. So the 5.7 million is included in the expenditures that have been budgeted for. To That's cover correct. The, um, yes. Yep. Shortfall. Um, but the, that shortfall is accumulation of, uh, I assume, 2020 and 2021. Uh, so that's already going to flow through the financial statements. It has already in 2020, and it will flow through in 2021, which draws down the surpluses in, in let's just say, 2021. But yet now we're, we're going to try to recover that in our 2022 budget. So no, the... I'm just going to sorry. I'll just jump in. The 5.7 million that is the annual. I'm going to say it's the annual shortfall that we are are potentially dealing with for 2022. It doesn't have anything to do with previous oh, okay. previous okay. Um, surpluses or anything um, at all in that regard. So what would have happened? Any surplus from a previous year that uh, we do have a year end surplus policy that that allocates, you know, where which reserves it goes into, but the majority of it ends up into our general uh, general surplus. So, you know, in one of my earlier slides, I think I said, you know, the that that balance was uh, of that reserve was sitting at about 9.1 million. So that would have taken in any previous surpluses that the city faced. The 5.7 million is just the, 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 the one time or the annual shortfall that we were having to contend with for the 2022 um, budget period. Okay, thanks for clarifying that. I thought, I, I, I thought that was included in uh, revenue shortfalls from the previous year. So thanks for clarifying that. Um, and I, I hate to keep kicking the dead horse here, which is a bike lane. Is that 4.7 million included in the 59 in the general expenses? Uh, Capital budget. Uh, it, it, it is included in the uh, yeah, in the capital uh, in the capital um, investment or the capital expenses for the general uh, general fund. So yes. So in you know I we had about fifty I think fifty nine million dollars in operating costs on the capital. Uh, you know, there's $46 million that's, that's included. And I think uh, that figure was, I think it's 16 million for general, the, the general revenue um, capital and, and that 4.7 million would be included in that. Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks for answering that. Um, and just to kind of um, just piggyback on what Diane was saying, the, the business community, the sentiment in the business community is, is one that you know they they're going to see that thirteen hundred dollar annual increase in our property tax, and they're going to look at the residential being under two hundred, and they're just going to feel like they're they're just carrying the cost again, and it, it's going to be a difficult pill for for the business community, I, I believe, to to swallow mm -hmm. is uh, that burden that's being put on their their shoulders. Yeah, yeah, but I think you know that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I appreciate that. One, one of the comments that, that I've heard <laughs> having done, I don't know, six, six of these <laughs> budgets now and uh, is that, you know, when you look at those numbers for um, for the business tax multiplier is just the, the spread amongst businesses. All businesses are not created equal. And so um, when when you speak, are you talking about small business versus big business? And like we have the same challenge with like stormwater where why why are we subsidizing, you know, huge uh, landowners uh, versus uh, and penalizing the small ones is would, would you say there's a different difference amongst your members on the chamber uh would you say it's the smaller businesses that are, are hurting more or? well I, I think they all feel the the effect of the property taxation any increase uh significant increase and obviously a larger business the larger their their tax assessment is as well right so it's it, it is kind of relative to it impacts the larger businesses just as much as it does the small business small business might feel a lot more uh, especially the you know the the small retail restaurants they're going to feel a little bit more than perhaps uh, some of the larger industry companies or industrial companies but nonetheless they're 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 facing utility increases they might be bigger consumers of electricity uh, than a small business so they're getting hit with that plus they're also seeing their property tax increase so it's a combination of things uh, I think it's a general sentiment across uh, 
uh, all uh, all the industries. But I've got we've got other uh, chamber members here. I'll let them speak uh, to that as well. Any of the oh, Daryl, jump in. Daryl, bringing the PETA lens too. Yeah, bringing the PETA lens. I'm going to kind of uh, open it up on what Jonathan said a little bit more. Is when when you have the bigger industries, a lot of them aren't as community centered as a lot of the smaller businesses. A lot of the smaller businesses have families, they're family run, the people want to live here and stuff like that. And some of the bigger companies, quite simply, are heartless beasts that they're not going to look at Penticton as a wonderful place to come and stay forever. They're going to look at it as, as a place where they're doing business. The company that I'm working for right now, last month, our electric bill was $84,000. So you look at a 2% increase and an increase here and an increase there and all that. And I'm sorry, the last company I worked for, they basically went on, they're moving. And they're moving because it is cheaper. You can spend the numbers however you want. And some of the, the bigger companies will look at moving a lot quicker than some of the smaller companies. So it does hit the bigger companies a lot more. And it's harder to replace one of those big companies, say a Penticton Foundry or a Cut Technologies or a Slimline, when they're gone, there's no reason for any of those big companies to move to Penticton. If you look years, the years gone by, and I'm not going to blame the city for everything that's happened. I mean, the connector did ha play havoc on business, the bigger businesses in Penticton, because no longer do the trucks have to go through Penticton. So Penticton actually has to become a real jewel, but some of these bigger companies, they will look at their bottom line and they'll look at their other operation that's down south. Metric Modular is a classic example of this. They had three operations. Penticton was the most expensive one to run. Guess which one they closed? They closed Penticton. There are other companies, like you have Peerless. They're not a single operation. They have other operations that they run with. There are other companies and they look at the operations from here and there and everywhere and they go, it's cheaper to produce down there, we're leaving. So when you look at the bigger businesses, it's not always anchored in the community. Sometimes they are that heartless monolith that will move at the drop of the hat. So we have to be very careful about how high we raise these taxes. Very helpful, thanks for that, Daryl. Yeah, that's good. Um, any other questions coming from the group? Um, I received a message that uh, the city could do some more uh, positive promotion on how a safe bike route helps with health and safety of all residents and visitors. And just curiosity if we do have plans to do that. And I would offer that um, there is a recommendation in the Community Climate Action Plan to, um, to educate and promote um, alternate forms of transportation. So not necessarily part of uh, the budget, but uh, definitely part of other uh, plans that are in the works. Um, Donnie, are Glenn, you? Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm uh, by no means do, uh, does anyone on the Zoom call want to elongate this meeting, but a quick question that I'd be very curious of the, the group that's participated. Uh, the theme of this year's budget is clearly community safety. As Jim said, 11 out of the 12 FTEs are for community safety positions. That doesn't include the five RCMP officers that aren't included in the FTEs. So it's actually um, closer to 16 out of 17. Um, is the theme the right theme, regardless of regardless of uh, whether the approach uh, Steve has mentioned, whether that's the the exact right approach? Is that the the theme that council should should carry on as they move to that? That's a question to Steve, John, Daryl, Diane, anyone who wants to to go. I'm just very curious about that in terms of priorities. Um, I'll comment on that. It's it's okay, Donnie. Um, uh, when it comes to the safety thing, I, th I, I agree that, that we need to do something with safety, but I also have concerns about when we say we're going to hire X number of, uh, uh, of bylaw enforcement uh, people. Um, I'm just hoping that those, the, that what we're not hiring are more uh, people attending parking meters. 
um, and that uh, somehow or other, because you got the extra personnel, you think that it's uh, that, that it'd be a great exercise to go out and try and enforce uh, even more parking restrictions. Um, if they are in fact coming in to help with uh, actual uh, issues around public safety, around uh, those kinds of issues, that's one thing. But um, again, it's, it kind of flows into that whole thing that I was saying about the RCMP and how are we going to utilize them? What are we doing with these people? And I know it's been said, well, we're going to uh, uh, put more bylaw officers on uh, in the later evening. Um, and if that's what's going to happen, then that's fine. But, uh, you know, if that just means that then we're just going to loosen, you know, loosen up the, the thing so that we can send more of them around, you know, looking at parking meters during the day, that's not overly helpful. That's not helping the, uh, uh, the crime issues. It's not helping the downtown uh, businesses. It's, uh, it's doing nothing more than feathering the nest of City Hall. Uh, and so I think we need to be really cautious about that. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Jonathan and Daryl, or Jonathan first, maybe? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the community, especially the business community, they, they, they want to know that the city is trying to be proactive with uh, safety. Um, we don't know what the, the solution is. Uh, like Steve says, you know, are we just throwing money away? Um, are we really addressing the issue? Uh, how much of it is mental health? Um, you know, the, the, uh, you know, years ago, I would have thought, yeah, throw more uh, officers on the street and that would take care of the problem. But as I'm learning, it, it's, it's much more complex than that. There's a lot of mental issue. The, the people who are prolific at the crime now, they're, they're very brazen. They're, they, they don't care anymore. It's as if they, they're, they're fearless of what might happen to them. Um, and that's what's really concerning for our, our, our members. Uh, when, uh, you know, elderly women at their stores, Ogopogo, who, who was attacked. I mean, that, that's, that's some fear amongst our members. Um, and they, we, we want action. But we don't know what the action should be. And, and that's getting back to Steve's question, or Steve's comment. And I know Diane and I, we spoke before, we were in a, a working group before, and we talked about this, uh, you know, is, is this money, uh, the policing efforts and the bylaw efforts, is that going to help deal with mental issues, mental health issues, or are they just going to be picked up, thrown in jail for 24 hours, and then back on the streets? And, you know, we don't know. We, we don't have the answer. We're not going to pretend that we have the answers for our members, um, but it is a concern. It's a big concern. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. Oh. And Donnie, I, I, I don't want to belabor this more than we have to, but I, I got to tell you, there is real concern out there, uh, and even with our, our own family members. Um, I think we've had an unprecedented uh, murder rate in and around Penticton this year. Um, the question is, is that a lot of these things uh, certainly appear to be drug related or whatever. That is a huge, huge issue. And I guess the question is, is if there's going to be a sense of, of safety that we really need to address this because one has to wonder how long it is before the gangs move in here full force. And that's a real problem. And it's something that people aren't really talking about a whole lot, or they haven't sort of put all the pieces together. But uh, I, I think that we really need to have a serious, serious look at, at, at this whole, how we are handling this safety thing. And, and Jonathan's right in terms of, you know, between the mental health issues and between the drug addiction issues and those kinds of things. It's not a simple solution just to say we're going to put three more officers on, on the ground or four more bylaw officers walking around at night. It's not that simple. I wish it, I wish it was. But uh, we've got some serious problems in Penticton as a group and, and the council really has to be considering this because uh, down the road, 
we're we're heading down a really really um, dangerous path here, and I think we need to um, you know take a look at it. Um, and uh, I, I read a thing the other day that said it's kind of interesting that there's uh, a highway to hell, but only a stairway to heaven. And uh, I think uh, we need to uh, really be taking a look at uh, how quickly are we heading down the highway to hell. Okay, th thanks, Steve. Uh, I hadn't heard that analogy. For but, the colorful uh, comments. <laughs> yeah, colorful comments. Uh, Daryl, then Diane, and uh, I should probably ask Council Rieger as well um, uh, if he's got any questions for the groups or any comments uh, before I know Joanne, I'll let you wrap it, wrap it up. I didn't mean to hijack your meeting. I don't no, get to no, come I appreciate to enough that. Of these. these are great. <laughs> okay. Steve, I hate to tell you this, but the gangs are already here. The violence is already here. We've got our heads buried in the sand. Now, when we talk about the RCMP and everything like that, I've sat on the safety and security committee and I watched our city council and I give them credit. They tried to sit down with the prosecuting, with the prosecutors and with the court system and they wanted to have a talk with them about the catch and release. They weren't even given a meeting. So we can hire 20 more cops if we wanna hire 20 more police officers. But unfortunately, as long as we have the catch and release where we're just pulling them in, writing the paperwork up and letting them out the back door as quick as they come in. They're not afraid. They are emboldened and they are, they are just moving forward. So I agree with the cameras that, that the city wants to put in. I think it's a good idea. I think it will, that will be more of a, more than anything than what the police officers would do because until the court system deals with it, and I do agree with the mental health and everything like that, we can hire 20 more police officers. They'll just be lined up at the door with the, the latest prolific offender, and they will catch and release. So is it really going to help the problem? Thanks, Daryl. Uh, Diane, uh, I saw you were off mute as well. I wasn't, but if you give me an opportunity, I'll speak. And I do uh, appreciate Superintendent Brian Hunter. I mean, he's got a, you know, he's got a large thing on his plate. And so I can understand his request for, for more help. But I think at some point we have to understand it's a provincial problem. It's a federal problem. And the more we take over their problem, the more that we're going to be imposed with growing debt in this city. And so we have other ways to spend our money. Thanks, Dan. Yeah, it is, uh, as everyone's noted, uh, not cheap resources. And and uh, back to Steve's earlier point, even with this sort of investment, will it have a major dent in crime uh, is yet to be seen. Uh, Frank, did you want to did you want to chime in at all on on anything? I, I'm super cognizant that this is Joanne's meeting and that uh, <laughs> uh, that, that's probably running lower on time here. So. <laughs> Oh, you I think you're remuted muted. yourself, Councillor Eager. Oh, there we go. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't mind uh, talking a bit, and we're very much focused here on uh, on the uh, crime and safety types of issues. But uh, just a, a couple of points I think are obvious that haven't really specifically been commented on. Like, like Steve is very much talking about uh, if we just simply uh, budget for more police and and, and they don't come uh, that isn't helping a lot. Well, just to confirm, if if we budget for the police and they don't get hired, we don't pay for them. So simply to get in line trying to get police, uh, the fact they're not coming right now and COVID I think is is a good part of why they're not coming. But uh, yeah, we, we uh, have two police in, uh, in, the, um, in the 2021 budget and then they're still not here as of, as of yet. But I think to get in line, there's nothing wrong with that, and and uh, and, and trying to address uh, Superintendent Hunter has been very uh, specific, trying to talk of being able to get beyond just simply taking care of some of the core uh, core um, uh, uh, help help requests coming in, the 911 calls, etc. He wants to get on to proactive policing and trying to get resources there and whether it's prolific, whether it's gang related, whether it's uh, quite a number of uh, areas that he'd like to be able to focus on and put some energies into that. But what he's flagged when he gives his um, quarterly reports to us is that he's virtually uh, 
virtually uh, handcuffed in, in trying to have resources there because just doing core basic proactive uh, uh, or not proactive, really reactive policing is is where his, his energies are, are, are going. So I, I certainly see that we need to keep trying the, the comment that this is a provincial matter. Well, actually, we get stuck with it, uh, quite honestly, the, the crime is in Penticton. Uh, the province is not going to come in and help us with our crime. And as commented, we're not getting the help from the court system either. Uh, with with uh, everybody seems to uh, adopt the phrase about the uh, revolving door. Um, you know, at some point, we have to continue to try and and uh, and uh, um, raise issues around this and try and try and gain um, try and gain some traction eventually we're not the well we're, we're in one of the worst conditions in, in the province statistically uh, with with our crime rate our what is it 170 uh, caseload per officer with about a 60 average uh, in in a right across the province average of a caseload per officer per, per year. That's uh, that's 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 a, 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 a exceedingly uh, um, you know challenge. <laughs> it's challenging. It's maybe one word, but worse uh, situation for Penticton. So uh, yeah, I'll, I'll I'll certainly be looking to hear uh, more ab ab about this. We 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 worked a bit reactively, saying let's try and hire and get get that um, that uh, request into the RCMP for for new officers. And I think we have. Uh, um, was it three that were added uh, uh, about three months ago uh, as, as, as a starting request in this and now this is going further so yeah I, I, it's it yeah it's challenging and no we're not we're not solving it right now that, that that's a fact but um, I, I think we're doing with the resources we have and the assistance we get from elsewhere I think we're, we're doing about what we can do given given our particular situation of a regional center surrounded by areas that don't have our problems because well because thank you thanks for that councillor rieger and your your timing is perfect i um jim do you mind sharing your screen one more time i just have two kind of wrap up messages um i do want to thank everyone uh for attending tonight and i'll just wait till uh jim's screen comes up because there's a few more interesting tidbits i want to flag for you just give me a second here as okay. i uh so just juggling my screens here to be able to pull that back up. Okay, okay. here we go. Okay, so I, I do want to flag for people that we are hosting a couple of in person open houses and uh, we're doing a multi topic open house. Uh, there's a couple of, of big items that are coming up and you're going to get a, an advanced look um, at the open house. So in addition to talking about the budget, uh, we'll also be um, sharing information on the North Gateway uh, and civic places and spaces, but new is the uh, designs for the point intersection. So if you're familiar with that, that's the um, intersection at Galt um, that will uh, replace the connection at Kinney. And we also have um, the uh, draft design for the next section of the Lake to Lake bike route for, for you to look at. So I encourage you to drop in at one of those sessions and also to share that information with your networks. Uh, next slide, please, Jim. And so um, I know that many of you are part of a business organization, so um, we anticipate and encourage you to formally share uh, your feedback with Council on the Budget, and but also share your feedback as individuals. Uh, I've taken notes tonight, but you can complete a feedback form online. It is anonymous, and you can share your, your feedback with Council. It will all be reported to Council at their deliberations um, at the start of November 22nd. And I think that's it for, for us. Is that uh, any more slides there? Perfect. All right. Well, with that, I'll return you to your evenings. I can't thank you enough for joining us tonight. And that was a really rich and meaningful discussion. So um, have a great night. Yep. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Hey, guys. Thank you.
I missed one good question that I will get back to Anthony um, after. Um, and he's just curious if any of the recommendations in the civic places and spaces are included in the budget. And I, I do think there is uh, some funding in there for design. Is that uh, fair, Jim? Um, what we currently have is there are some items included. They're not in the budget. They're actually uh, in the, uh, I believe, in the unfunded portion, oh. just to reflect that that those are some uh, some things worth considering. Uh, but until council makes uh, makes some decisions, just with regards to those recommendations, uh, they are not yet included in the budget. Can I ask one question on that on this uh, civic places and spaces uh, uh, situation? Sure. Uh, I'm, I'm curious as to why the public uh, and and interested parties only have one month in which to uh, react to this report, and yet it's taking you years to get to this point between the federal government and provincial government, and you guys even have to go out and hire uh people to put into your staff in order to get the information and so on and you uh -huh. put all of this information it's taken you 18 months to get all of that together and uh -huh. yet the public are given one month to to react to it and we know for a fact that uh colliers did not talk to any of the people uh that are directly involved with a lot of the facilities that came up um, I think uh, this, uh, again, I think council needs to bring this to a screeching halt until they get a chance to get the people that are involved in this process and the people that have uh, a vested interest in these facilities get a chance to really look at it, analyze it, and take it from there. I, I, I find it... Uh, I find it incredible that uh, we would be asked to respond to this in one month when you guys have had years to put it together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and good, uh, uh, very, uh, very valid point, uh, Steve. I think, you know, part of the challenge that we had is when we embarked upon this is sort of the scope and the, I'll say the multitude of assets that we were looking at was uh, was immense and so you know our scope started off with all of our general assets because utilities